if you have questions today, uh, please type them in the chat box and we'll answer as many as time permits and those that are relevant to today's topic. Um, following today's session, you will receive an evaluation and we ask that you complete it as we value your input on not only today's event, but future events. Again, we apologize for the technical challenges we're having um, in getting our panelists all together here, but bear with us. Um, at this point in time, I would like to introduce Shirley Wilshire, our Executive Director for the American Association of Access to Equity and Diversity. Shirley, welcome. Shirley? Okay. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Welcome. All right. No, that's my fault. I muted myself and didn't realize I'd done that. Um, once again, <laughs> good afternoon, and I'm delighted to, uh, to say hello, uh, and I want to thank Sandra and our, our, our board members, uh, Marilyn and Yolanda, who are participating in this webinar. This is a very important webinar, and um, we are delighted to have so many people uh, joining us. Uh, again, we're the American Association for Access, Equity, and Diversity. We've been uh, formerly the American Association for Affirmative Action, so we've been around since 1974. We are the longest serving membership organization that represents equity and diversity professionals on Capitol Hill, in the federal agencies, before the media, and, and the courts. 1600 Pennsylvania is right across the street. We're at 1701, and we represent you 24-7. College presidents have ACE, admissions counselors have NACAC, and the university lawyers have NACUA. You have AAAED. We urge you to open a membership if you're not a member uh, or renew your dues. And we're having a, uh, our annual um, New Year's um, promotion with a 25% membership discount. We wish you access, equity, and diversity. So starting on December the 15th, we are uh, giving a, a discount for your membership. We need your help right now, especially given the challenges uh, since uh, uh, November of 2016. Uh, with that, I will end with, with my promotion and commercial, except to sign up and join us at our annual meeting in June. Uh, we look forward to seeing you. Uh, with that, I will give you back to, to Sandra. Thank you, Shirley. We're so happy you were able to join us um, today. Um, a couple of other announcements here. I want uh, you to be aware what we have coming in 2018 uh, regarding our upcoming webinars, unpacking the reasonable accommodation conversation, achieving win-win outcomes with the Job Accommodation and Network Accommodation Toolkit. Um, we also have ADA, ADAA. Um, in February, we have Understanding the Landscape Regarding Student Diversity and Inclusion in Higher Ed, Connecting Research, Law, and Policy. Um, at February 22nd, we have the Essential Components of Effective Workplace Respect Training. Uh, Fran Seppler, who recently developed the training for the EEOC on this uh, respect respective workplace uh, training. So we hope that you're able to join us um, in the coming year and that you'll consider joining. And um, as Shirley mentioned, there will be a special coming out tomorrow. And once that goes out, I'll make sure everyone on this call receives that uh, communication. So with that, I want to introduce our um, facilitator, moderator today, Marilyn Schuler. Uh, Marilyn Schuler, JD, has been working in the field of equal employment opportunities since 1988. In 2010, she established Schuler Affirmative Action Practice, a law firm specializing in federal contractor compliance, providing clients with strategic advice and analysis related to all aspects of affirmative action compliance, and producing AAPs 
consistent with all CCP's regulations. Ms. Schuler was the Department of Labor's Affirmative Action Officer. She also served as the OCCP Oakland District Office Assistant District Director and in San Francisco's regional office as the OCCP Liaison and as a Regional Civil Rights Officer. She was also the Affirmative Action Officer for the Office of President at the University of California. Prior to establishing Schuler Affirmative Action, AAP, Ms. Schuler was Director of Affirmative Action Program Development at Morgan Lewis and Bacchus. Ms. Schuler served as President of the Washington Metro Industrial Liaison Group and Chair of the 2014 ILG Conference. She is the first Vice President of the American Association for Access, Equity, and Diversity. Welcome, Marilyn. Thank you. And I, in turn, would like to uh, welcome all of you to the webinar today. Um, it's going to be incredibly informative. We have some distinguished speakers, which I will introduce. And at that point, I will hand the baton over to our speakers, who will take it from there. Um, the, our first speaker is Yolanda McCarty-Harris, and she is a Senior Certified Affirmative Action Professional and serves as the Director for Equity and Compliance. In her role, she is responsible for creating, implementing, and monitoring the university's affirmative action plan and translating workforce data into tools to institutionalize inclusive recruitment retention strategies. She also supports and provides advice to academic and administrative leaders in their strategic efforts to increase diversity in university employment practices and prepares and files required federal, state, and university compliance reports. She brings to the university over 15 years of experience in the public sector, including nine in higher education, and her energetic and passionate servant leadership approach to compliance has assisted organizations in achieving effective and strategic outcomes uh, to diversity and inclusion. She previously served as the director for the Office of Institutional Equity at Cleveland State University and was also the university's Title IX coordinator. She was also the director of Equal Opportunity and Diversity at Youngstown State University and has served as a senior attorney addressing employment-related issues at the city of Toledo in Ohio. Ms. McCarty-Harris is a licensed attorney in Texas and Ohio and received her undergraduate degree from UT Austin and her Juris Doctorate from Southern Methodist University School of Law in Dallas, Texas. She currently serves as membership chair on the national board for the American Association for Access, Equity, and Diversity, which, as we know, is the oldest operating association of professionals in the EEO affirmative action profession. We also have our distinguished speaker, Howard Cowan. He previously held a similar position as Title IX Compliance Coordinator at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Excuse me. Other positions Mr. Callum has held include Chief Regional Attorney for the Office of Civil Rights, OCR, U.S. Department of Education, uh, D.C. Enforcement Office for 16 years, and in OCR's Policy Office for four years. Uh, Senior Equal Opportunity Specialist with the Office of Equity and Diversity Services at George Mason University in Virginia. U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission for 14 years and was in private legal practice before that. So we're looking for a real clear inside scoop here. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And we also have Darlene Posey Young. She's a Six Sigma Green Belt with 25 years of experience analyzing problems, improving processes, and implementing projects. Her professional experience includes having served as Vice President of Business Support and Operations at the Bank of America Ch Merchant Services and in various information technology and human resource roles for Brown Forming Corporation in Louisville, Kentucky. Ms. Young currently serves as Director of Staff Equity and Diversity and Title IX Deputy for Indiana University Southeast in New Albany, Indiana. She has received certification as a Senior Certified Affirmative Action Professional, we know them as CAP, and as an ATIXA Level Three Title IX Investigator. Ms. Young works collaboratively with the campus community to develop strategy and facilitate initiatives that foster a diverse cultural climate, promotes legal and com policy compliance, advocates student safety, ensures equity and recruitment and employment practices, and creates a place of belonging for everyone. And at this time, I am going to ask Yolanda to please speak to us about the learning outcomes uh, for today's program. 
Yolanda. And while we are waiting for Yolanda to come on the call, um, I will just sort of provide, uh, I will read through what we have here, which is that we're going to be talking about an overview of the guidance on Title IX sexual misconduct issues. The 2011. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You can take it from here. I'm sorry. Um, I had to uh, mute on there. Uh, but as you were stating, we will be talking about an overview of the OCR's guidance on Title IX uh, sexual misconduct issues. We'll also be talking about 2011 guidance versus the 2014 guidance and any concerns uh, as it relates to that and what does that mean and so how are we uh, focusing on those areas. Uh, the third item we'll be talking about is an overview of the 2017 guidance. What does it say about the evidentiary standard as well as what about mediation? Is that something that we're allowed to do right now? And the last thing we'll be talking about um, is insight and strategies on what to do next and what does that mean? Uh, the 2017 guidance actually mean for your organization and I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing here at University of Texas at Austin. So with that being said, I think the next one up is Howard. Are you there? And you can I take us over and awesome. So go into your area and we will wait to hear what's, what's on the horizon and uh, some guidance on OCR as well as it relates to Title IX. Thank you very much and I hope you can hear me. I apologize for being late to the call. Um, OCR first issued guidance on sexual misconduct in 1997, and I know that because I was with OCR at the time, and I led that effort. And it addressed, as it says here, harassment of students by, uh, by school employees, by other students, by third parties. Um, then the Supreme Court had a couple of decisions that came out after that, um, which recognized sexual harassment as a form of sex discrimination. So OCR revised its guidance in 2001, and, and I worked on that as well, um, and then began to implement it. It issued a Dear Colleague letter in 2003, which addressed uh, First Amendment and academic freedom implications as they come up in um, sexual harassment, racial harassment, other types of uh, complaints. Then in 2011, in response to um, a growing number of complaints specifically on the issue of sexual violence as a form of sexual harassment, as well as um, uh, some outside investigations about this issue, OCR issued the 2011 Dear Colleague letter. And that was the, the letter that got a lot of attention and in turn, spurred a lot more complaints being filed by students against both colleges and universities and school districts alleging that their schools hadn't handled sexual harassment properly. That was in turn followed in 2014 by some questions and answers that were intended to um, clarify and address some of the questions that had arisen out of the 2014 11 Dear Colleague letter. In 2015, OCR issued another Dear Colleague letter and a guidance document that talked about the role of Title IX coordinators and their responsibilities. Then finally, most recently in 2017, OCR rescinded the 2011 and 2014 guidance and um, issued uh, an abbreviated Dear Colleague letter with questions and answers. Um, while they were going to reconsider the issue entirely and issue um, new regulations at some point in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So there were a number of concerns that have been expressed about the 2011 and 2014 guidance over the last several years uh, by pretty much all parties. Um, one immediate concern was that it was adopted by the agency without much input from schools, from colleges, from advocacy groups. When the 1997 and 2001 guidance were developed, the agency had focus groups with any number of organizations, with the American Association of University Professors, with the National Education Association, with the National School Boards Association, with the Association of American Universities, um, the National Women's Law Center, 
a whole host of um, organizations to try and get input on um, what the guidance should say. And then both guidance documents were issued in the Federal Register for notice and comment and revised in response. Um, but that was not done with the 2011 and 2014 guidance. If someone, um, if someone is rattling papers, someone, someone's rattling papers, if they could put their phone on mute, I'd appreciate it. Um, anyway, um, so that was one of the concerns, that the um, guidance was not developed with input from colleges and universities, from interest groups, and therefore wasn't as practical as it could have been. Um, another concern about the guidance was that it seemed to say that investigations had to be completed within 60 days, 60 calendar days, and that's quite impractical. And um, in fact, in the 2014 FAQs, OCR sort of backed off from that and said that it presented it more as a typical investigative period, but um, it still was interpreted as a requirement and, again, caused a lot of uh, difficulties for schools. But the biggest source of concern came from um, primarily from respondents, from students who were found responsible for sexual misconduct and who um, were claiming that they weren't treated fairly in the process. Um, they, and, and the 2017 um, Dear Colleague letter had this within it. Many schools have established procedures for resolving allegations that lack the most basic elements of fairness and due process, are overwhelmingly stacked against the accused, and are in no way required by Title IX law or regulation. There's actually very little evidence of that. There have been a number of court cases on the issue, um, but those court cases generally have not been decisions on the merits. They've only been summary judgment motions with allegations and not with findings of fact. But OCR has, is, has taken a position that tends to favor respondents more, or at least present more attention to the issues of concern to respondents, and believes that um, many schools' procedures haven't been fair and balanced and transparent. So um, we have this guidance. And um, the new guidance, most fundamentally of all, um, a concern about the OCR's guidance comes from the fact that some forms of sexual harassment can also be crimes, sexual assault, stalking, and the like. And, and, and many in the public, many commentators have said that because that, those types of misconduct can be criminal in nature, schools shouldn't be involved in investigating and adjudicating them at all even though schools have long included theft, physical assault, drug offenses, and other possibly criminal behavior in their codes of conduct, and nobody really has been concerned about schools pursuing those claims. So those were some of the issues that um, were being presented to OCR and caused OCR with the change in administration to rescind the um, previous guidance. And if you can go to the next slide, please. So then comes the 2017 Dear Colleague letter and Q&As. The good news is it makes it very clear that schools are still required to respond to reports of sexual harassment when they know about it or, or have reason to, um, to know about it. But then it goes on to say that the agency wants to give schools more flexibility in with how they respond to those reports. Um, it says that the 2001 revised guidance on which the 2011 Dear Colleague letter was based is still in effect. And, um, and that's good because it does have a lot of the foundational information there about how schools should respond. The uh, Q&As have a lot of discussion of the Clery Act, which is a law that applies to sexual violence, um, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. Even though it's not enforced by OCR, it's enforced by another part of the Department of Education, the Q&As do address many of the Clery requirements and because they overlap in, in large part with what 
the OCR is doing. Also, when you read the 2017 Dear Colleague Letter and Q&As, keep in mind that in OCR speak, should is only a recommendation, uh, generally. A must is something that they expect you and require you to do, but when they say should, it's generally an encouragement. And so there are very few musts in the 2017 guidance, and I'll highlight a few of them, but most of what they're doing are, can be read as recommendations. Now, how they enforce or apply those recommendations in complaints remains to be seen. Um, one of the changes is, because so many schools and we're concerned about the 60-day time frame, they've decided that there is no fixed time frame in which to conduct an investigation. And instead, they say that we have to make, and I'm quoting, a good faith effort to conduct a fair, impartial investigation in a timely manner. So a good faith effort to conduct a fair, impartial investigation in a timely manner. Uh, we still have to have um, adequate grievance procedures, and our grievance procedures still have to include time frames for the major stages of the process, but they are not holding us to a specific 60-day time frame. Another point that is, is that's made in the guidance is that the burden is on the school to figure out what happened. It's not up to the parties to make their cases. It's not up to the complainant to prove that he or she was sexually harassed. It's not up to the respondent to prove that they hadn't engaged in sexual misconduct. The burden is on the school to get information that's reasonably available and relevant to determine what happened. They also opened up the door to the possibility of informal resolutions. The um, previous guidance had said that mediation was not um, appropriate for use with sexual violence cases, and um, this guidance says that it, it, it could be, and um, Darlene is going to talk about that right now. Thank you, Howie. Next slide. You guys hear me well? Yes. Wonderful. In my role as a campus compliance officer, I've experienced high levels of success using mediation to resolve employee conflict. However, in my dual role as a Title IX deputy, I, along with many of you on the phone that are student affairs professionals, share a collective goal. That goal is to stop sexual misconduct, support the victim, and prevent reoccurrence of sexually inappropriate behavior. So I have a few questions I would like for you to consider. Question number one, mediation, while it involves voluntary compliance, can you keep your campus safe from potential threat using this resolution option? We know that mediation provides a confidential forum for resolving disputes without revealing publicly you know, the intimate and embarrassing details of conduct that might otherwise have to be disclosed in adjudication. But the fundamental question is whether a private agreement reached between the parties can stop the conduct and prevent it from happening again. Good case management should reveal potential repeat offenders, but remember, most sexual violence cases do not lend themselves to mediation. Question number two, does mediation protect the parties from a psychological perspective, a physical perspective, and their privacy? Well, being in the same room with someone you view as an enemy, it can be quite intimidating and frightening, particularly from the standpoint of the victim. The confidentiality of mediation offers a considerable advantage over adjudicatory proceedings where intimacies and degradations would likely reveal for public consumption and consequently embarrass both the complainant and the respondent. If physical safety is a significant concern, a face-to-face -face mediation session is not an appropriate alternative. Question number three, can mediation address behavioral patterns that lead to continued sexual misconduct? Mediation may not be suitable when there is an imbalance of power between the parties. Power is less of an issue when a trained mediator can remain neutral and the complainant and respondent's ability to self-determine the outcome of their conflict is protected. In conclusion, the 2017 Dear Colleague letter gives schools discretion to decide 
when the use of mediation or some other form of alternative resolution, such as restorative justice, would be appropriate. I've shared a few questions with you today to help you consider and decide when mediation is a good practice. Thanks for your attention, and I'll now turn over this discussion back to my colleague, Howard. Hi, yeah, and you mentioned, um, Darlene mentioned restorative justice, and let me talk about that just for a minute. Um, that's another alternative resolution approach, and it's designed specifically to address some of the power imbalances that um, Darlene mentioned, as well as to bring in university or community interests in broader safety concerns. It, unlike mediation, it provides a role for the university in determining what the appropriate um, outcome should be. Um, it is structured to provide supports to the parties during the process and to address any broader campus safety concerns. Um, basically, restorative justice is a process to give the complainant, the, 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 the reporting student, a safe and supported space to let the respondent, the accused individual, know the impact of the respondent's conduct on the complainant and the opportunity to work together in a protected way along with others affected by the conduct. There could be ripple effects on friends of the parties. It could be ripple effects in, uh, in the dormitory where the, uh, the, the sexual violence may have occurred or within the organization. Um, to come together and figure out how the recipient can address that harm. Uh, for most of our student conduct processes, uh, the goal is to make them developmental so that the people involved learn from the process. And this really is, um, fits within that um, model. It's intended to help the complainant, either directly or through a proxy, um, explain to the respondent the impact of the respondent's conduct and help the respondents come to appreciate and accept responsibility for that conduct and be a part of the decision-making process on how to restore the complainant and the university to the place they would have been had there been no harm. There's a group called Campus PRISM, P-R-I-S-M, that is working to promote the use of restorative justice in sexual misconduct proceedings on college campuses and if you're interested further, you might want to take a look um, at the information they have if you just can search for Campus Prism. Um, let me go pick up again with the Dear Colleague letter, uh, the 2017 version. Um, as I said, much of the reason for OCR's action has come from concern for pressure on, from the respondents. And so you see in the Dear Colleague letter in the questions and answers, a number of provisions that specifically address what OCR believes to be the rights of respondents. The first uh, example of that is the issue of interim measures. The guidance says we still have to provide them, just as the 2011 and 2014 guidance says, and in fact, the 2001 guidance as well. But the 2017 guidance specifically says we have to apply, provide interim measures to both parties. So just as a complainant might need uh, to have a, a final exam scheduled, rescheduled because of a hearing is taking place on a particular day, so might a respondent. Um, just because, just as a complainant might need some sort of counseling to deal with the stress of the original assault and the stress of the investigation, a respondent might need counseling to deal with the stress of the investigation because they're facing the possibility of serious sanctions. So we have to provide interim measures to both parties. And the guidance tells us that in doing so, we can't make any assumptions, we can't make any, have any fixed rules that favor one party over the other, which is actually consistent with the rescindant guidance. Uh, guidance. In other words, what they're saying is don't automatically assume that if the complainant and the respondent are in the same dormitory, that it's the respondent that has to move. If the complainant and respondents are in the same class and one of them has to move, don't automatically assume that it's the respondent who has to move. Take a look at the circumstances, take a look at the nature of the allegations, 
and um, make those kinds of decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. Similarly, don't, if you get a complaint, don't automatically suspend the respondent on an interim basis. Only do that if there's a, you know, a clear indication of an ongoing threat or danger. So again, just don't do anything automatically. Don't have any automatic rules. All these decisions have to be made on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, there's a footnote in um, 19 in the guide in the questions and answers, which talks about um, evidentiary standards. Previously, OCR had said that we had to uh, use a preponderance standard. The new guidance says that we can use e any standard we want, which will generally either be a preponderance or a clear co and convincing standard. Preponderance is more likely than not. 51%. Um, clear and convincing is generally seen as, you know, as maybe 75, 80%, sure. So it's a, it's a higher standard and could result in fewer findings of responsibility. Um, OCR cautions schools against having a preponderance standard for uh, sexual misconduct, say, and a clear and convincing standard for other forms of student misconduct. It does, they don't say that they're going to, that's necessarily going to be a problem, but they do say that they want schools to think about if they have a justification for having a different standard, a lower standard of proof, of evidentiary standard for um, sexual misconduct. And there are, in fact, some good reasons for it, which is why OCR said preponderance in the first place. Title IX is a civil rights statute, unlike uh, fights between roommates or academic uh, misconduct. When you're dealing with civil rights issues, the courts generally use, a, they do use a preponderance standard. In most of our employment discrimination investigations, we use a preponderance standard. Um, so there are, it can be reasons to have a preponderance standard specifically for sexual misconduct even though you might have a higher standard for other forms of student misconduct. Um, the guidance also says um, that if a student has been found responsible for sexual misconduct, that um, we have to balance the enforcement of our code of conduct with the impact of separating the student from his or her education. So. And I'm not sure what, the, I'll be honest, I'm not sure what that means. If you found that a student sexually assaulted someone else and needs to be off campus, suspended or uh, expelled in order to protect the safety of the complainant and of the school, I'm not sure how the impact on the respondent's education is going to be relevant to that. Perhaps with lesser types of misconduct, uh, more generic sexual harassment, they're suggesting we can make the punishment fit the crime, as it were, and uh, not, ha not rush to suspension. This is one of the few musts in the Dear Colleague letter, though. They are telling us that we have to, as I said, balance the enforcement of the code of conduct with the impact of separating the student from the respondent from their education. Um, they also say, and this is a change, going back to the 2001 guidance as well, which says that while the normal, the principle generally of whatever rights you give to one party, you have to give to the other party, here, when it comes to appeals, it, it is okay to only allow respondents to appeal, but not complainants. That's up to the school to decide whether they want to give both parties a right to appeal. Um, again, not sure how that squares with that general principle of what one party has, the other party also does. Um, finally, uh, the guidance does say, there is a question that says that existing resolution agreements that were reached under the prior guidance will remain in effect and the issuance of the new guidance doesn't affect them. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Yolanda for, to talk a little bit about um, what schools should consider doing next. Hi, this is Yolanda. How are you? I 
really I'm here really to talk about what we're doing here at UT Austin. And I know a lot of it has been talked about from a student perspective. My office, uh, the way we have it set up here is that we have an overall Title IX coordinator. And then those cases that are student to student are dealt with by our Dean of Students office. And the cases that involve, involve employees are dealt with with our office. And pretty much what we're doing is we're standing the course as it relates to, to where we are. We're still using the preponderance of evidence standard as it relates to it. How are, um, Howie, I would re really be uh, uh, interested in what it means when it says that the burden of the school and not on the parties, uh, because we, we have used the preponderance of the evidence standard and basically have looked at it from a totality of the circumstances type of issue, but did they give any guidance on what that means when it says the burden is on the school as opposed to any individual party or not? No, they didn't, but what I think it means is that a student hearing, student conduct hearing, isn't like a court where you just okay. say, okay, complainant, you make your case, okay, mm -hmm. respondent, you respond. No, instead it's up to the school through the, an investigation or the hearing process to go out and get the information that the school needs in order to make a decision. That, you know, so you can't just rely on interviewing the, the witnesses that the parties identify. If there are other witnesses that you think mm -hmm. might have you information, then it's the school's obligation to um, get information from those witnesses or at least try to do it. So it's, it's, it's not that sort of adversarial kind of process. It's, it's the school has that affirmative duty to uh, get the information that's reasonably available to figure out what happened. Well, that, that definitely makes sense. But uh, what is interesting, though, is that we are getting a lot of uh, requests from various uh, news publications asking about uh, what what we are doing differently, and pretty much as we as I stated, we are staying course with our uh, guidelines, and we updated our guidelines in 2015, our sexual harassment policy, along with our procedure and practice guide. But uh, as far as we're concerned, and what we've been told from our legal affairs, we will continue to do what we do and make sure we have a fair and equitable process for both parties involved. So, is um, in terms of what to do next, I would say uh, always really consider um, uh, ensuring that you talk to your leaders of your institution as well as your legal affairs office and in, uh, any HR if you're dealing with them on the employment side, uh, we bring them in too, uh, but pretty much we're staying course. Is there anything else that my colleagues would like to add to that? Um, this is Howie again, yeah, and I think that uh, uh, makes a lot of sense. As I said, much of the guidance are should. There are just a few musts. Um, when they come out with the final guidance, which, or, uh, which will probably be regulations and which could take, what, they have no timetable, it could be a year or more, um, you know, they may make some further changes. So, you know, you have to question whether you should be making changes mid-course now when you might have to make even further changes or reverse some of your changes when the final regulations come out. They, and so uh, I think most schools probably are, are if, if they're doing anything at all, it's just tinkering. Mm -hmm. As long as they believe that they have a, a fair and balanced, uh, you know, procedure that provides due process, they're in mm -hmm. time to stick with uh, their current procedures. Oh, and to add to that, uh, Howard, we are not changing. We still have our 60 days in our um, uh, procedure and practice guide, and we, you know, try to shoot for that. But like you said, it's pretty much unrealistic to really get there. But it's um, um, that process of not making sure, I guess, requiring that be happen is, is really good for our institution because it was very, very hard for us to get that 60-day window accomplished through these cases. The other thing I'd add is that um, it, it will be interesting to see over the next several months how OCR applies the revised guidance. Um, I expect that OCR will be issuing more resolution agreements that will focus on respondent rights. Um, the Obama administration issued an agreement in, involving Wesley College just before uh, the election that focused primarily on the rights of the respondent and criticized the school for not uh, recognizing them. There have been at least one or two similar resolution agreements issued by the current administration, one involving George Washington University, critical of the school for not providing what OCR felt was adequate rights to the respondent. 
so again, I'm going to go back to that. If you think you already have a fair and balanced process that does provide um, the rights to the respondent, comparable rights for both parties, I think you know you, you're pre going to be pretty good with with that. Um, on the other hand, if you think your procedure is slanted too much towards a, the complainants, for instance, then you might want to consider um, uh, making some tweaks to, for instance, for interim measures to make it clear to respondents that they are entitled to get interim measures just as the complainants are. Okay. So I want to. Marilyn, I don't have anything else to add to that. So you can uh, go into the Q and A if you would like. Yeah, I was. I, you're right on cue. Um, I was just going to say. <laughs> Thank you to all of you for uh, for your contributions. I I want to kick things off with a question of my own, which is, um, do you do and, and any of you are welcome to respond. But um, do you think that these new standards will have a chilling effect on complainants? Um, that maybe people will be less willing to come forward if they are concerned that. Um, you know, perhaps their their allegations might not be taken seriously, particularly in light of the the idea uh, that they won't have the ability to appeal a ruling. Um, what what are your thoughts on that, in in terms of uh, complaints going forward? Marilyn, this is Yolanda. I will say basically, I think when this first came out, I think it it, it did have some some concerns with uh, various uh, advocates. I would say on campus, uh, including uh, our students. They were concerned about it, but I think once you uh, educate them about that fact that we are staying course here at the University of Texas and we're still committed to ensuring that we have a safe campus here, uh, I think they are they 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 understand. I think one of the things that we have here is that we're so decentralized in a lot of things that we do that people can't understand the various processes. So it's like, okay, who do I go to for this? If I'm a student, I'm a student worker. Then it comes over here. So, so, so some of those things is about education and, and awareness and basically providing a, a lot of trainings to help them understand it. I think once we do that, we're going to be good here at University of Texas. Yeah, and, and that leads me into, you know, um, can we anticipate any changes in the training requirements for employees and students? Um, do, Howie, do you have any thoughts on that about yeah. whether that might be happening? No, yeah, I do have thoughts, and I don't think we can anticipate any changes. OCR really, in its guidance, didn't say much about training, particularly requirements for tra of training. Um, they did require, in some of the resolution agreements, that training be offered. But most of the requirements for schools, for colleges and universities about training actually come from the Clery Act, not Title IX. And, and the Clery Act requires us to provide uh, training, to offer training, to all new um, employees, faculty, staff, to all new students, to have ongoing education and awareness programs, um, to train all those involved in the investigation and adjudication of complaints. Um, so those remain in place. OCR doesn't have any uh, jurisdiction to change that. The Department of Education can change the those requirements because they're required by legislation. So they, they will remain in place. I don't see any uh, changes in education. I don't think schools should use this as, see this as a, a reason to slack off on their education and awareness efforts. Marilyn, Thank this you. is Darlene. Um, at Indiana University, we have seven actual campuses and we're just using a, taking a proactive approach by making certain that um, we're educating from in places like our freshman seminar courses to getting students involved um, in the peer training for the prevention of sexual violence. So we're just being proactive in terms of training and making certain that all of our investigators are trained and everyone in the process that we have are well trained and able to help our students stay safe. Well, thank you. and. Um, uh, you know, one one question for for all of you is that uh, you know at some point we will anticipate that there will be a notice and comment period. Um, and what are your thoughts on whether AAAD uh, might be proactive in putting together 
comments and, and would all of you be interested in working with me on that <laughs> if we were to go forward. We've AAAD, of course, uh, has put forward uh, notice and comments um, on, on several uh, regulations in the past and uh, they, they have, um, it has resulted in the regulations uh, reflecting the concerns that we've raised. So, um, and, and as I understand it, they're always read uh, by the folks in the agency who are putting together the um, regulations, or at least that's how it was at uh, OFCC, or it has been at OFCCP. Um, what are your thoughts on the notice and comment to each of you? This is Yolanda, and uh, of course, I guess I'm a little bit biased since I sit on the board. I think definitely uh, with us being uh, one of the, uh, or the oldest organization dealing with these issues, I think we would be uh, remiss if we did not provide notice or comment on the issues that are, are facing uh, our universities and colleges as well as the uh, entities in general. So yes, I do think that we should be uh, providing comment as it relates to that. Well, that's great, and, and we'll certainly, um, and I, I won't put the other speakers on the <laughs> on the spot any further, but, uh, you know, we'll certainly welcome uh, comments from our membership, um, and, and I'll, I'll put in a plug for membership at this time, because we certainly do incorporate the concerns and comments from our membership when we're putting together um, the, the comments uh, when we've done them, and clearly uh, there's a lot of interest in, you know, the uh, regulations, um, the uh, letters that have come out from OCR and, and will continue as we anticipate. Does anybody have a, uh, an inside track on, on when the next set of guidance or, or any communication coming out of OCR will be coming? Well, I think, this is Howie, I think that uh, the, the, the short answer is no. Um, it's pretty clear they're going to issue regulations as opposed to guidance, so they have to write the regulations, they have to get them cleared by the Office of Management and Budget, and they have to put them in the Federal Register for notice and comment, get all those comments. They will get thousands and thousands of comments. They, they do take them seriously. They will read every one. That will take a long time. Uh, and then they have to revise the guidance, you know, in response to the comments where they see fit. So we're talking about a, a rather lengthy process. Also keep in mind that um, Candace Jackson is the Acting Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights. Um, there is Ken Marcus is uh, currently been nominated to be the permanent um, Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights. And when he comes on board, um, assuming he's confirmed, and we don't know when that will happen either, he may have a different view of some of these issues, which could further uh, um, hold things up. So uh, really is no uh, clear time frame. I've talked to folks within OCR and they don't even know. Right, right. Well, and uh, we, we met with OCR as a board uh, back in September and I believe they issued this guidance the day after we left their office. Yes. Which, yes, they did. Uh, you know, I'm sh <laughs> and no, I know they didn't do it as a result of our discussion with them because they would have had to have prepared it beforehand. Um, but all this to say that um, they were not, uh, they did not give one hint that something was coming uh, as quickly and as significant as it was. So I suspect it'll be mums the word up until we hear it, up until it's published, um, whatever it is. So um, they did ask for our assistance though. Um, I think it was on the technology aspect. They invited us to come in. So uh, we'll, we'll be looking into that and, and make sure we follow up on that. Uh, but yes, Ms. Jackson's in an acting position, and until that role is filled, we, uh, uh, um, it's interesting that this has already happened, even under the acting director's leadership, um, but the, the agency continues forward, um, as the other agencies have, without, uh, when they're without a leader. Um, any other uh, thoughts or any questions? For, I'm, I'm not seeing any questions from the participants. Um, I think we've covered most of the questions that came in ahead of time. Um, I will invite each of you to provide some last comments, if you like, um, starting with uh, Yolanda. Well, thank you. Uh, I want to give a great shout out to my colleagues, uh, 
uh, they're definitely on our boot, what I call boots on the ground, making this happen. I, I think this is a very important area and one that everybody is watching, uh, both nationally as well as what's happening on our campuses as it relates to it. Uh, I just want to say that as long as the process is fair and equitable, and uh, there's some things that we all take away from this for our school to talk with our other leaders on campus, but we're definitely committed to, to ensuring a safe, and, uh, a safe and respectful campus, and I think uh, the more information and knowledge that we can learn about these things, the better uh, that we can accomplish what we need to accomplish. Thank you. Um, Howie? What she said. Absolutely okay. agree with everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Darlene. I just wanted to make a shameless plug for membership. Um, I just want to, I want, I want the, um, the listening audience to know that as a professional, I joined the organization in 2008, and it was the best uh, investment I could have ever made um, in terms of my career in affirmative action. Um, if you are serious about getting to know individuals who have been the boots on the ground for years, you will be able to meet people um, in the, from business, from academia, um, and just all over in this organization. We're small but mighty. Please at least take a look at us. It'll be worth it. All right, darling. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, and, and, and I also want to add that one thing that distinguishes this organization from, say, the ILG, which um, is another uh, force. Um, ILG doesn't focus particularly uh, much on the academic issues, um, but they but we also provide training um, through the PDTI program, and um, we're looking into broadening that program as well. But uh, we offer training throughout the country throughout the year, um, as well as these regular uh, webinars. And uh, yeah, I, I second uh, Darlene's comments about membership and the benefits of membership. And of course, as was mentioned earlier, we have the upcoming conference in uh, June in Atlanta, which is a very, very easy uh, airport to get into. So no matter where you're coming from, it's, it's an easy flight. Um, and uh, I would look forward to seeing all of you there. And at this time, I am going to pass it, the baton back to um, either Sandra or Shirley whoever would like to make some closing comments. And thank you all for coming. This is Sandra. We want to thank you again for joining us today, and we hope that you will consider uh, joining the American Association for Ex Access, Equity, and Diversity if you are not already a member. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in future events. We have some uh, exciting things happening uh, in 2018, and we hope that you will ride alongside with us on that venture. Shirley, any last-minute comments? Um, no, I have none, but thank you, everyone, um, and thank you for the plug for membership because that's what sustains this organization. And one other thing, we do Title IX as well. The ILG does not, uh, as, uh, as I recall. So I think we're broader. That's, you know, when, I, when we changed our name, we understood that your experiences and your responsibilities were broader as well as more, a lot broader than they were in 1974. Access, equity, and diversity is what we cover, and we do it 24-7, as I said. I'm right next door to where the action is for well or whatever. But um, we definitely uh, uh, need your support. And thank you for those of you who have been members. Many have been laboring the vineyards for many years, and we really appreciate your support. Thank you, everyone, and, and uh, thanks a lot for, for signing up for this. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.